Happy Earth Day, first of all, to everyone. Um, a few days late, I know Earth Day was last week, but it was also Easter and Passover holidays. So um, I sort of pushed the webinar back to the following week. Um, it's now uh, the 52nd Earth Day. The first Earth Day was in 1970. And so um, a lot of the issues of environmentalism you know, some are the same and some are new. So one thing that is definitely new is the ability to incorporate uh, these green environmentally friendly ideas into your investment portfolio. Um, so this is me, uh, my, here's my contact information if you'd like to reach out. Here's the poll we just did. Um, and so I wanted to cover the uh, four main approaches to green investing. Uh, the first is a traditional approach, which generally is, is giving money to charity. The second approach is divestment or um, taking your money out of certain, certain things like fossil fuels. Um, then we have impact investing. And finally, a big one, especially recently, is ESG investing or environmental, social, and governance factors, which um, Gabe uh, will be touching on in a little bit. So just to start we have with a traditional approach, um, this is just look at your investment portfolio, make as much money as possible, and then um, if you're worried about the environment, you can donate that money to uh, charity. Or if you are very well off, um, like Douglas Tompkins, the founder of North Face, you, you can buy up parts of Patagonia and turn it into a conservation area. Um, obviously, most of us are not going to be as rich as Douglas Tompkins, but um, you know, there's a lot of good environmental charities out there that could use our funds. So um, by doing green investing, I'm not saying you shouldn't continue your um, donations to charity, but it's just another option that you have. Uh, next, we have divestment. Um, and so usually in the green environmental area, we're talking about removing your investments from fossil fuels. Uh, usually uh, when we're talking about divesting, we're thinking of it as a moral choice rather than an investment approach. Um, so we sort of ask, you know, is it, can you sleep at night knowing that you're making a profit from this company? Um, some people can, some people can't. Um, what um, evidence shows is that divesting alone is not an effective way to create social change. Um, but it has been with us for a long time. Um, there's always been sort of a moral conflict between people's views and the capitalist system. So this goes back to um, the Quakers. So this is Benjamin Lay, who's one of my favorites. Um, he was one of the first abolitionist Quakers. Uh, he really advocated in the 1700s to uh, end the practice of slavery. He was also a big advocate for free commerce meaning um, he would only buy goods made by free people, not enslaved people. Um, more recently, we have divestment movement from apartheid in South Africa. That's often cited as an effective divestment campaign, but we also have to consider that it happened in context with a larger social movement. Um, and then more, even more recently um, is divestment campaigns uh, for fossil fuels from endowment funds like the one at Yale, you know, Gabe is familiar with, or um, the California pension system and other large um, institutional funds. But like I mentioned, this might not necessarily punish the companies in the way you might hope. So this isn't uh, an environmental example, but this is an example of a vice fund because historically, if you're interested in social values investing, your options were limited to um, religious type funds or, you know, alcohol, tobacco, firearm type funds. And so here, this is a vice fund. So this is a, a fund that would invest in only uh, arms, gambling, tobacco, that type of thing. And you can see that's represented by the purple line here, its performance over the past 10 years. And the orange part is the um, worldwide stock market index. And so until recently, 2020 or so, you can see that the vice fund was doing better 
than the stock market generally. Um, only recently, you can see it's more fallen off. But like I mentioned before, you had limited choices, but more recently, we have a lot more on the market, um, a lot more options. If you would like to incorporate any of uh, a larger issue like general um, low carbon funds to more specific environmental concerns like specific to the ocean or, or just forests or electric vehicles, you can get very specific in terms of your issue. Next approach I wanted to go over was impact investing. So impact investing is when you put your funds towards trying to create a social good or environmental good. Um, impact investing tends to sort of fall in the middle between charitable giving and traditional investing where you would get a larger return. Um, so impact investing, you can typically expect some kind of return, but usually nothing huge. Um, and a lot of impact investing is in the bonds or fixed income space. So just one example I was reading about recently was uh, this charitable group that worked in the Pacific Northwest. They worked with low income people who were getting large electric bills um, and having trouble paying those bills. And so what they would do would they would go in, most of their homes were not um, insulated properly. So they would go in and insulate their home, which would help reduce that, their energy bills. Um, but as a charity, they're always trying to get funds to do this type of insulation work. So what they did was instead was they, they partnered with an impact investment fund. And this fund gave them a loan and they built a windmill. And the windmill generated electricity, which they then sold back into the electric grid. And then they took proceeds from those sales and used that money to help these low income community um, insulate their homes and lower, ultimately lower their electric bills. So that's a type of an example of an impact investing that um, it's sort of in between a charitable work and an investment, um, but it does create a positive impact in the community. Um, that's, like I said, sort of on the bond side, but if we look at the equity side, um, you could look at an investment in clean energy as a type of impact investing. So um, I think oh, there's a myth out there that this type of investing doesn't give you good returns or these are failures of companies. So I just wanted to show an example of this is FAN and ETF in the wind energy industry. Um, and it's fairly recent, it's about three years old. You can see that how that type of wind energy ETF does compared to the worldwide market. Um, it's not, I just, it's just illustrate that it doesn't necessarily mean by investing this way, you aren't gonna get decent returns on your money. And finally, uh, the fourth approach is environmental, social and governance factors. Um, you know, environment, how a company um, affects the environment. Uh, social is, you know, how the company is involved in its community. And governance is generally within the company. What's the leadership like? Um, how do they treat the employees? That type of thing. Um, but at this point, I wanted to turn it over to Gabe, who, uh, Gabe Brisman, who is, Here's a little bio. He co-founded Your Stake Software, which Propel uses and I really love. I think clients really like it too. Um, and Gabe's background is in, like I mentioned earlier, fossil fuel divestment campaign at Yale. And um, he also publishes widely on different social values and ESG investing issues. So thanks for joining us today, Gabe. Thanks so much, Amanda. I realized I should have pulled up a, an old picture from uh, the fossil fuel divestment days that you could have used instead of the stock photo for the divestment. Oh, yeah, movement. okay. <laughs> could have stuck Sorry. myself in there. <laughs> that would have been fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited to talk a little bit about, this is really my, my passion and why I'm spending all my time on it. I think that ESG, environmental social governance investing can create a ton of impact and oftentimes can be misunderstood. Uh, so um, I... I think a lot of the history was covered by Amanda already, but I want to focus specifically on 
the difference between the terminology that you'll hear now, uh, even within the ESG space. So there's the traditional approach, there's divestment, there's impact, there's ESG, but sometimes you'll hear SRI, social responsible investing. Sometimes you hear sustainable investing. Sometimes you'll hear faith-based investing. Sometimes you'll even hear ethical investing or mission-related investing, or there's a whole bunch of different words to call it. Um, and the ESG actually, I think, which might be helpful to, to clarify, ESG's starting point was, you know, all these things that companies are doing that impact the environment, that being good steward, uh, reducing pollution, fighting climate change, uh, their, their social metrics, their diversity, all these things impact their performance as well. And it's, it is something that you can't ignore as an investor. You can't just look at what their most recent uh, revenue was of a company. You have to look at all the metrics of what a company is doing because that is having more and more evidence of correlation with financial performance. So that is kind of how in really the, the 2010s, I think, a lot of uh, ESG investing really picked up was there was more and more evidence that it's, it's values alignment and really helps with a lot of performance, which Amanda was showing kind of based on those, some of those charts. A lot of people still are excited about it from a values alignment perspective, uh, but that's, that's kind of a big change that happened in uh, 2012. And then in the 2020s now, there's, there's so much more ability to really align your investments with their values, both with transparency, um, that's what we really focus all of our time on, and the amount of products that are available. So there's a lot more data. We use over a hundred different metrics on your stake that can allow you to assess a portfolio. A lot of times people like to narrow in on the metrics that are most relevant to them. Uh, but uh, that's something that uh, also leads to a lot of different products becoming available, a whole bunch of different strategies that can match what you're looking for and that uh, Amanda spends uh, all of your time uh, focusing on finding the best ones that, that fit with uh, your client needs. So the ESG trends are really exciting and powerful. And I think a lot of people in, that, in the initial poll said maybe you have some investment in um, sustainable or, or earth-aligned investing, climate-aligned investing. And a lot of people didn't know. And a lot of people are looking to add more. I think that's generally the trend. It's pretty amazing that this, 20, this number of 85% of individual investors express interest in sustainable investing strategies. That's from 2019. In 2017, it was 75%. It's, it's growing all the time. And the amount of dollars invested in sustainable strategies is also growing all the time. So you can see that uh, 2019 was a giant jump. 2020 was another giant jump. And then uh, more recent charts are still being produced and coming available where there's another huge jump in 2021 of people really moving dollars in this direction because there's more, again, data availability and ways to actually invest in alignment with, uh, with these dollars. Uh, and alongside those trends come questions. So I think that's something that uh, your stake really tries to provide and, and Amanda is able to help with is how much of this is uh, real, what is actually going on, what does a sustainable investment mean? Uh, a lot of times when things grow so fast, uh, there's a, a lot of noise. And that's something that we find it's really important to be able to cut through that noise and really show actual information on what, what is going on behind all this growth. Uh, what is actually happening? What are the portfolio managers and companies within your portfolio really doing? So the last thing that I'm most excited to talk about is how ESG and sustainable investing creates impact. So Amanda talked about impact investing where you might be directly funding a project or buying up land for conservation or something like that. Um, that is some, something that creates very clear impact uh, as well, but on the ESG or divestment side of things, a lot of times the impact comes from these first three bullet points. So shifting company incentives, it's really amazing. Uh, we've seen a lot of evidence. Actually, we started in the academic literature and, and then have found this anecdotally too. When you have enough people really building a movement and demanding more sustainable policies, fund managers and companies need to listen. 
and there's a lot of evidence. Uh, Deliveroo is a great example. There, there are a lot of other examples where companies are now changing their policies as a result of the demand in the field for social, uh, social, socially values aligned investing. And that's something that shifts company incentives when let's say you ask Amanda tomorrow for, uh, for a more values aligned portfolio. Amanda hears that from enough people, talks to fund managers. Fund managers hear from enough financial advisors. They're talking to companies. They're kind of bringing these incentives up the chain and that's really moving, uh, that's, that's shifting what companies need to do. Then there's also shareholder engagement and proxy voting. So that is, if you own a company, you have a voice and the ability to change that company. And there's a really strong rack, track record of success as well in pushing companies to change based on these votes. So you may have heard of engine number one, which made a lot of news last year for replacing a lot of members on the Exxon board of directors. That is one example of actually a pretty small uh, fund manager pushing a company to really have a lot more climate alignment uh, based on using voice. And then public signaling is really the main way of creating impact through divestment. So Amanda talked about South African apartheid. It was an example of uh, being within the context of a movement, creating a lot of uh, impact by helping to accelerate corporate, uh, corporate and public awareness of these issues. And that's something that still happens all the time that uh, divestment is a really good complement to shareholder engagement to help create pressure. And it's, it really complements ESG really well uh, to, to move company incentives and, uh, and, and do that. Uh, and then that last bullet point, greenwashing is not how ESG creates impact. It is the one thing that could derail it, where a lot of uh, fund managers and companies will proclaim more than what they're actually doing. And we think our thesis for impact is that by eliminating greenwashing and by providing transparency and calling that out, that will lead to real rigorous uh, ESG metrics and investing and help to uh, create this impact that's possible. Yeah, um, thanks Gabe. That was, I think that was a really great explanation of, of what ESG can do, um, especially if you're focused on, you know, how you can change things at companies. Um, you know, ESG does have a benefit of showing enhanced performance as well. And so even if, say, you're not so sure about doing this, um, we always encourage people to look at ESG funds also from just a performance perspective too. Oh. Okay, I sorry, I see a question that came in. So, oh, it's about at your stake, do you compare conformance of your ESG factors or is that up to the investor or financial advisor? Do you wanna take that one? Uh, Sure, I could. Um, yeah, so your stake is more focused on just the um, as, um, the other, I don't know how you would phrase it, other metrics aside from performance, right? Like um, how much pollution you're creating, how much carbon, um, or how much you're reducing the carbon, how much, um, you know, how many women are on the boards of companies. It just, I mean, your stake has a lot of environmental factors, but it does go beyond into other areas like women, minorities, um, you know, recently like Russian exposure is one, um, all different types of metrics if you're interested in. Um, but as far as performance, um, uh, it links to performance of different, different funds. So you can, um, do it that way, or you can pick a fund that you think has good performance, put it into your stake and see what the um, social value metrics look like, which is generally what I do in a portfolio. I hope, does that answer the question? Okay, write, write more if, if you have more follow-up. Um, I think uh, we have still have some time, so I'll... Um, I just wanted to cover the approach to ESG investing. You can approach this from either an active um, investing approach, which is generally like mutual funds that use uh, an investment manager to pick the, the stocks in the fund, 
or a, a passive approach through an index, um, which is more to, to like using a computer algorithm to determine what should be in the index. And so um, there are uh, the, uh, a lot of indexes on the market um, that include ESG as one of the metrics that they screen for of what companies are included. So, um, you know, um, here's just one example of iShares, which is a BlackRock a big ETF provider, they have one for ESG leaders. And so they just take a universe, uh, say like the S&P 500, the 500 largest companies in the US, and they screen it for the highest scoring ESG companies. Um, so this is more of, um, they are not using divestment as a, a lens in their, th in their um, index. And so this index would include these, I looked this up the, recently, these eight different oil and gas companies would be included within this ETF. And so um, it gets back to the point that Gabe was mentioning, some people conflate ESG investing with environmental concerns. And um, I'm not saying that they're advertising it this way, but um, sometimes it does cause some confusion around people thinking they're buying an environmentally friendly fund. And you know, you might not be getting what, what you signed on for. So when you're doing these types of investing, it's always good to look beyond the advertising, look beyond the headline and see what's really in it. And is it what you want? Because um, for some people, they want to do the divestment. Other people say it's, it's not for them. So um, just keep that in mind. And then another example is a more active approach. And so this is an example. There's different mutual fund companies out there. One of them is Parnassus. Um, Calvert is another big one. There's several mutual fund companies that focus exclusively on ESG investing. Um, and so this is an example of an active fund that divests from fossil fuels across the board. They don't buy any fossil fuel companies. And then they apply ESG metrics um, or evaluation um, independently. So they'll look at a company, um, look at their, um, you know, their fundamentals, say, of their financial statements and that type of thing. Um, but they also consider a lot of the qualitative um, environmental, social, and governance factors. Um, and then they also speak with the management companies. Um, I know, like, Parnassus in particular, they, um, they owned Amazon stock for a long time, and they would talk to Amazon about um, concerns they had over their labor practices. And in that way, they were trying to influence Amazon to change some of um, the ways that they treated their employees. And then um, ultimately, I think Parnassus, they gave up on and Amazon and sold out of their position. But um, that's just an example of how you use this ESG approach to try to move the needle at some of these larger, larger companies. And then um, just in a practical level, how do you do this? Um, most people are investing for retirement through their 401ks. Um, a lot of 401ks do not offer ESG or green investments, um, but it really depends on your workplace plan. Um, you can check to see if you do have a what's called a brokerage window, which allows you to invest um, outside of the plan. Um, but it's very highly dependent on your employer. Um, the next group of accounts, these are just different tax advantaged accounts. So these are the type of accounts that we help manage for people. And you can access any type of this green investing or social values or any other type of investment that you could get anywhere else. Um, 529 plans, uh, a lot of, if you're a parent like me, um, you know, there's a million choices of 529 plans. So it really varies by state, but more and more states are starting to offer ESG investment choices. Um, at last count, I counted 18 different states that offer them. Um, uh, and then finally, a brokerage account, that's just your regular um, investing account. And that gives you access to all types of investments, uh, including green ones. And then I just wanted to include a little bit um, 
about how Propel um, works. And so when we have a client, we like to talk to you about um, your individualized financial goals. Um, you know, usually typically it's retirement, but it's also saving to buy a house or saving for your child's college or, or whatever the case may be. But in addition to those just financial goals, we can also talk to you about your social values and how you can incorporate those into your investments and, you know, and, and what's appropriate for you. Um, we do, we are a financial advisor. A lot of people think that means you have to have some huge account. Um, we are not like that kind of financial advisor. We have no account minimums. And um, like I mentioned, we use your stake. And so here's just an example of a your stake report. Here's a sample portfolio compared to a benchmark. And so I just selected for the sample some different environmental metrics like air pollution, clean energy, deforestation. Um, and so you could see how your portfolio would compare to a benchmark. And if you say, oh, look at that, air pollution in minority communities, I don't like that. You know, how come I have so much of this compared to the benchmark? And then, you know, um, this is where we say, look under the hood and say, what, what is it that you own that, that's contributing to this? And we can get down into it and see what it is. And then see if there's a suitable substitute that would make sense for your portfolio. And then finally, I see we have a couple more questions, but I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. Uh, final poll. And on this one, you can pick more than one. Oops. Uh, either uh, which approach to green investing would you incorporate into your investment portfolio? So you can do traditional or charitable donations, divesting, impact, ESG, or I'm not sure. And I'll leave this open for a minute or so for everybody to make their selections. Okay, Gabe, I think this question is for you. I don't know if you followed this. Um, Warren Buffett being criticized for not signing on to the UN sustainability standards. Um, do you have an opinion on um, what will happen at the Berkshire Hathaway meeting this Saturday? I um or have you not followed this I don't know. I haven't followed that too much I have followed Warren Buffett generally being critical of ESG and getting a lot of pushback for that mm -hmm. um I don't know exactly what will happen at the annual meeting but I do know that there's more and more pressure being placed on annual meetings and more and more people seeing uh that as a use uh, as a mechanism to create change I just saw a photo actually of <laughs> people activists chaining themselves to a Wells Fargo and the ask on all their poster signs was vote yes on shareholder resolution number three at the Wells Fargo annual meeting. And that's the first time ever that people, people are really taking their activism to the annual meetings and trying to push companies to change through that mechanism. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of pressure at the annual meeting and a lot of people trying to get Warren Buffett to make this change. But I, I uh, can't speak specifically to to this uh, upcoming one. Yeah, yeah, I think it was, I think the, it was um, brought up last year. I don't know if last year was the first time, but I know it's been coming up periodically and the pressure does seem to be growing um, and he seems to um, not be yielding to any of it. So, <laughs> but, um, okay. So it looks like everybody has voted. Uh, so I'll just end the poll and, um, share the results. Hopefully everybody can see what came up. It looks like everybody is interested in ESG. Um, and then we have a handful of people for impact, divesting, and um, traditional. So that's interesting. Um, Danielle says, I think that choosing not to follow the UN standards is not the same thing as ignoring ESG ideals. Yeah, definitely. I don't, yeah. I mean, you can follow the standards of the UN without signing on to them, you know? Um, and I do know that Warren Buffett, I can't remember off the top of my head, the name of that energy company, 
they own has been doing a lot of work um, on doing renewable energy um, investments. So just because you're not certified doesn't mean you're not doing it, you know? So there's always that. And so I do think that that gets into some of what we were saying earlier about your stake. You're not relying on just some other outside group certifying you or saying you meet this ESG score or that type of thing. You can say, I care about renewable energy investment. And, you know, presumably Berkshire Hathaway will come up as somebody who's investing in some renewable energy um, type of thing, right? So. Mm -hmm. And I think <laughs> Buffett generally is, uh, is anti the UN standards, but also has gotten pushed back on ESG in general, even outside of the UN. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, but I uh, probably should stop saying more because I don't know the full uh, context of everything going on, but he has been generally critical of the field, not just the UN um, standards. Uh, okay, okay, interesting. Um, okay, so um, with that, that covers all our materials. Um, you know, I'll put in a little plug for the podcast that Emily and I do together, Connecting the Dollars. Um, we have an episode coming out soon on inflation. Um, and when the webinar ends, it's gonna send you automatically to do a survey. If you have time to complete the survey, we appreciate it. Um, Gabe, I don't have a slide for you to plug your website or anything, but, um, but you can find Gabe on LinkedIn if you wanna read his articles or, or I think you post them on Twitter too. Um, I don't know if you wanna share your handle with people who are interested. Sure. Uh, I'm definitely more on LinkedIn. I can share that, oh, that okay, link yeah. if you want. Yeah. Um, just look, just search Gabe Brisman and y'all, you should come up, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, here we go. I'll pull it up now. You're going to share it? Yes. Um, oh, okay. Here we go. Oh, there. Oh, I see you put it in the chat. So there's a link to Gabe's LinkedIn. Um, I don't know. I think you published some interesting articles about, especially lately, about greenwashing. Um, but um, it's nice to see uh, a critical lens on some of the things that are out there. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I'll be publishing a recap of all of the ESG events in April. Uh, coming up in uh, in a week or so. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll look for it. Um, okay, and with that, um, thank you everybody for coming. I uh, appreciate it. Um, like I said, the survey will pop up and please reach out if you want to incorporate more green into your portfolio or um, have any other questions. We're always here. Thanks so much for having me, Amanda. I really appreciate it. Okay, yeah, you thank you so much, Gabe. Have a good one. You too.